Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, welcome to um, another edition of a series of workshops we are doing uh, in the Shock Project. This workshop is called Introducing the Newly Launched EMM Survey Registry. The workshop will be given by uh, two speakers, Laura Mola Morales and Amy Saji. They come from Sciences Po from pa Paris, France, and they are working in the field of political science. Laura specializes in political dynamics and consequences of immigration with civic and political inclusion of migrant origin minorities and survey research on migrant origin populations. Ami is working on the shock project as junior researcher, and she has previously worked in the uh, NGO sector, working with uh, refugee settlement uh, topics, migrant integration, and workforce development. A few housekeeping notes, the way uh, this uh, workshop will be conducted is the following. The webinar you are attending is being recorded and you will all receive a link to the recording later. Uh, we are making the slides that we will be using in the webinar today available to everyone. You can see the chat bot box for the link. If you have any questions, also use the chat box to type in the questions, and we will put the question to the speakers at the end of the webinar. I would now like to introduce the shock project a little bit uh, so that you know uh, the context this webinar is given in. Shock means social sciences and humanities open cloud. Uh, the project represents one of the five cluster projects forming the European Open Science Cloud, also known as EOSC. This project will run for another two years until April 22 and is bringing together 45 collaborating organizations that are contributing to the SSH domain. Uh, the main objectives of the SHOCK projects are seamless integration of, the, of SHOCK into EOSC and the SSH open marketplace, where high quality tools and data will be openly accessible, but also secure. SHOCK also supports the development of state-of-the-art research infrastructures, as well as research communities in maximizing reuse through open sciences and fair principles. This webinar is part of the SHOCK training act activities with which we try to support various research communities uh, in social sciences and humanities, but also we are interested uh, in targeting other individuals uh, to meet their needs for new skills and to promote the outcomes of the shock project, such as the EMM survey registry, to which you'll be briefly introduced today. If you would like to keep up to date with the shock training opportunities, we invite you to sign up for the shock newsletter on the landing page of the shock website, as well as to follow us on Twitter. If you want, you can also check our training events page uh, on the SHOCK website, and we also provide a direct link in the chat box directly. Also, if you're an experienced trainer or someone who is just starting out training other people, we invite you to join our training community, which will provide a Europe-wide directory of certified trainers. The link can be found both on the SHOCK website and in the chat box right now. Uh, this is it from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, again, use the chat box for questions and join our community. And now I give the floor to Amy. Thank you, Daria, um, for that lovely introduction and presentation of Shock. And thank you also to you as well as your colleagues from Work Package 6 of Shock for helping to set up this webinar. Um, so as Daria mentioned, today's uh, webinar is very much focused on a new tool that we have developed called the Ethnic and Migrant Minorities, EMM for short, Survey Registry. In short, what this tool is, it's a free and publicly available tool that is intended to serve as a one-stop shop where a user could go and learn about existing quantitative surveys that have been undertaken with EMM populations. Now, before I go into kind of the meat of the webinar today, I also wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of you who are joining us uh, today. Um, 
based on Friday of last week, we have had over 100 people sign up for the webinar. Um, they're coming from 37 different countries from across the globe. So really excited to see so much interest, um, not only in Europe, but beyond. And we hope that for many of you um, for which this is a new kind of tool that you're learning about, I hope that this webinar can serve as a launching pad for future opportunities for collaboration. Um, in addition to this geographic kind of diversity of the webinar participants, I also wanted to highlight that we have um, individuals from all different disciplines and sectors. Uh, we have individuals not only from the private sector, civil society organization, the data archives, for example, but naturally a lot of uh, individuals who are working as a researcher themselves, but also in affiliation with a research focused institution. Um, so keeping in mind kind of the diversity of our webinar participants, we've really tried to tailor this webinar so we can achieve the following learning objectives. Uh, first, we want to show how the EMM survey registry was conceptualized and developed in line with the FAIR principles. So that means making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We also wanted to show how the EMM survey registry and its survey level metadata can be used and leveraged for a wide range of research and policy related work. And then finally, we wanted to show how the EMM survey registry has been set up so it can be sustained and updated in the short and long term. And to achieve these learning objectives, we structure this webinar as follows. So I'm actually going to start by providing a, a brief overview of the Ethnic and Migration Studies Data Community, which is the collective group that has developed and launched this EMM survey registry. Then I'm going to pass things off to Laura Morales, who is then going to provide you with a very detailed overview of what the EMM survey registry is, why we believe it is a fair tool, and also do a live demonstration of the current state of the front end of the registry. And then she's going to pass things back to me, and then I will do a presentation of the back end of the registry, uh, specifically in terms of how it is uh, linked to the sustainability aspect of the registry. And then I'll also do a live presentation of the back end itself. And then I'll conclude by highlighting and pinpointing uh, the key next steps for us as a data community to continue developing and enhancing the EMM survey registry. Um, so as you can see, we'll be covering a lot of different content and materials. So as Daria pointed out, at any point that you think of a comment or a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat. And at the end of the designated Q&A uh, section, we'll go through each and every comment and question. So they're addressed um, and you come out of the webinar with uh, a better understanding of, of what the tool is. So in terms of the Ethnic and Migration Studies data community, it is a formal data community that is part of the shock project that Daria had presented. And what this data community is, it brings together the different types of actors that are involved with quantitative survey research undertaken with EMM populations. Um, so that means we have individuals who are the data producers. We have also the data managers, and we also have the data users. And because the data community is uh, has so many different types of individuals involved, we've then kind of split up the data community into three distinct groups. So first we have what we call the Task 9.2 team of shock. Um, it's a very small team. It's made up of myself as well as Laura Morales, who is the lead of this task, um, and a handful of research assistants. And we are essentially the participants and contributors to shock on behalf of this larger data community. Um, and our primary role is to coordinate and manage the scientific work that this data community is doing. The second group is called Ethnic Survey Data. It's an international network funded by the Cost Association. It has more than 200 different EMM-focused researchers from Europe and beyond. And because it is a research-based network, it has been set up to provide the intellectual impetus for the scientific work that we're doing as a data community. Now, the third group, um, which is called Fair Ethnic Quant and is the newest to join our data community, is an open science project funded by the French Agence Nationale de la Recherche. And its main objective is to ensure the inclusion of the French surveys in the scientific work that we do. So as we talk about the EMM survey registry, it's um, helpful to keep in mind the various individuals that are involved and the groups that are involved and understanding that we're all contributing in different ways to develop this EMM survey registry. 
So in addition to this data community being um, dedicated to a specific discipline, so in this case, the ethnic and migration studies field, we have a collective goal, which is to make quantitative survey data on EMMs more accessible and reusable to a wide range of users. So that would include academic researchers, non-academic researchers, policymakers, for example, but not only in Europe, but also beyond. And so within the context of the Shock project, we as a data community have planned for two specific deliverables. The first is launching this EMM survey registry, which again is a free online tool that is intended to be fair and will display compiled survey level metadata for over 800 different quantitative EMM surveys that have been identified in 30 different European countries. And this tool is currently live and beta version and is of course the center of today's webinar. And then the second uh, deliverable, which is now just starting to kind of uh, get into motion, is testing the feasibility of setting up as part of the SESTA-LEB European Question Bank, the EQB, a component dedicated to the EMM surveys that we have identified in developing the EMM survey registry. So hopefully at a future time, we'll also be able to dedicate a webinar uh, to talk about this second deliverable. So that's um, it in terms of what I wanted to kind of present to you in terms of the Epic Migration Studies data community and what led us to, to develop the EMM survey registry. And I'll pass things off to Laura so she can do her presentation of, of this registry itself. Okay, thank you very much, Amy. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon uh, for this presentation of um, uh, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey uh, Registry. Actually, Tanya, I don't get the... Okay. So um, I'll start by discussing um, what was the, the, the rationale and the, um, uh, the, the context in which we have uh, created this um, uh, registry. And uh, all of you who are working in the field of uh, ethnic or uh, migration studies will be well aware of uh, the wider context of, um, uh, of a need, uh, a growing demand uh, to understand ethnic and migrant minority populations. Um, in the past 30 years, especially uh, Europe, as, as we all know, has become uh, increasingly a very important destination uh, for migrants that have uh, been coming from all over the world, um, either for economic or uh, political or family uh, reasons. But at the same time, uh, European societies are not uh, socially homogeneous. Um, we find a, a situation where several countries across uh, Europe and, and beyond Europe as well, uh, clearly, um, include uh, within their populations uh, specific uh, minorities um, uh, in whichever way we can and we want uh, to define um, what ethnic minorities are. This could be linguistic minorities or could be religious uh, minorities. It could be uh, national um, minorities of, of various sorts. And um, there's a, a wide range of um, actors that are increasingly interested in learning more about uh, these populations and what are the processes of both inclusion and exclusion um, that they face and what are uh, the various um, aspects in terms of uh, uh, policy making that can foster um, uh, their inclusion and uh, uh, that can allow us to combat um, discrimination. So, given this, uh, the, the community, the data community that AMI has um, uh, just referred to, and primarily from uh, the intellectual impetus of the cost action ethnic survey data, uh, what we set it about uh, to do was to try to create a resource uh, that would allow us to uh, bring um, uh, better value to the existing uh, resources linked to survey data on these populations, both on ethnic minorities and on um, migrant minorities, primarily across Europe, but also um, in neighboring countries that uh, wanted and were able to participate. So with these goals in mind, um, our main objective in the past uh, three years and a half has been first to design um, a survey registry that would be in line with the FIR principles. And that would allow us um, to uh, create a tool and a resource for researchers, not just in academia, but also in other types of organizations. Uh, for example, 
local, regional, and national governments, as well as uh, think tanks and civil society organizations, or, or even, for example, data journalists. So whoever uh, feels the need to have more information about the various uh, processes of um, inclusion, integration, exclusion, and discrimination of uh, ethnic and migrant minorities across Europe. And we've done uh, that by ensuring that this um, resource uh, and database that we've created uh, conforms to the four main principles uh, that are um, called FAIR. Um, and FAIR stands, as you will probably know, for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So um, uh, the work has been designed uh, so that uh, the uh, registry will allow us to uh, easily uh, locate uh, surveys that already exist uh, across Europe. And um, it does so by uh, conforming a census of what are the existing surveys that have been produced since um, early 2000. And as I will be demonstrating in a few minutes, um, this is achieved by uh, making sure that the tool is easy to navigate uh, in terms of the information that it provides um, by having a very detailed and, um, and rich set of information, what we call metadata, or so data about the data, uh, for each of the surveys that uh, have been uncovered, that have been identified um, in each of the countries that will be eventually um, included. And this is um, uh, found and this can be retrieved in a user-friendly interface, uh, what we call the front end. AMI will be presenting a separate part of the registry, which is what we call the back end, which allows us um, to manage those surveys and in the future allows uh, the survey registry to become uh, self-sustainable through the participation of the data uh, community, primarily um, uh, and, and, and most importantly, the data producers, but also um, uh, academics or researchers who may be aware about uh, surveys that are not already captured in uh, the registry. The second uh, goal, making data accessible, is achieved um, uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, by making this uh, detailed metadata of each of the surveys uh, publicly available online. Um, but also, uh, very importantly, as I will be showing in a little while, by uh, giving links and providing um, access to the, the different uh, URLs or, or um, digital object identifiers where people will be able to find the technical documentation, where they will be able to find the questionnaires, and when they, they will be able to find um, publications that already exist in relation uh, to that particular uh, survey record. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, the registry is um, uh, going to be uh, and has been designed to be interoperable by setting uh, the metadata such that they can both be uh, clearly easily uh, shared um, with you humans, but also so that it can be retrieved in automatic ways uh, through the machine uh, readable uh, um, uh, software and automated processes, uh, and primarily so that it can be uh, retrieved uh, by other social da uh, science data archives and, and repository. And we do this by um, offering uh, ways to download uh, the survey metadata in DDI uh, compliant formats. Finally, uh, the registry has uh, the goal of making uh, data reusable by uh, providing metadata that it's uh, very detailed, that it's uh, informative and it is uh, organized and structured in such a way that will promote uh, such reuse. It will allow uh, people interested in, in analyzing the data to understand properly what kind of survey um, they are dealing with and what kind of survey they are uh, uh, actually uh, looking um, the information at uh, so that they can then uh, reuse the data, uh, primarily, obviously, for those um, survey records that are then the data set is actually available in another data archive. And, um, and one of the points that we will want to do and uh, moving forward and one of the points we will want to foster moving forward is uh, promoting uh, people to share uh, the data further and make it available uh, for other researchers. So to um, nudge people to um, uh, make the data more easily accessible in the future as well. 
Now, for um, uh, this group, and as uh, Ami was saying before, this work has not, be, not been done exclusively in the context of the shock project, but um, uh, that the work, uh, the intellectual uh, design of how the registry was going to be set up and what type of uh, metadata variables we were going to capture from uh, the different surveys, um, all of that was uh, discussed and uh, uh, done through various iterative processes within uh, the cost action ethnic survey data, where dozens of uh, colleagues uh, all across Europe have contributed both uh, at the design stage and then at the implementation stage of actually finding, retrieving and documenting all of this uh, um, survey data information. And we've done this through kind of very systematic uh, methods and, and processes, um, which included um, in a first stage, uh, the limiting the scope of what types of surveys we were going to be including in the registry. And um, uh, after uh, long uh, periods of discussion, uh, we decided to focus only on sample-based um, uh, quantitative uh, surveys that were in, uh, focusing on at least one dimension of the integration of either ethnic or migrant uh, minorities in, in the countries that are covered by the cost section ethnic survey data, but also very importantly, this had to be um, survey data that met um, a certain uh, uh, sample size uh, criteria. And, and it's important to um, specify and clarify here that this includes both surveys where the target populations were exclusively uh, ethnic or migrant minority populations uh, as the target population for the surveys, or um, uh, general population surveys where ethnic and migrant minorities were a substantial uh, uh, subpopulation that was uh, targeted in the survey. Once these uh, um, uh, the boundaries of uh, the scope of the work were defined, um, the search process was defined in a very careful way, and we homogenized instructions of how each of the national delegations uh, within the cost section had to look for surveys, what sort of uh, 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 search um, patterns and protocols they needed to follow, um, as well as um, uh, what types of sources they needed to um, uh, consult uh, so that the search would be as comprehensive um, as possible. Um, as a reminder, as I said before, uh, we were only focusing on surveys that had been conducted uh, since January 2000. So essentially, we've been focusing in the past uh, 20 years in terms of the on the period. Um, the, the next step was to document the metadata and for this task all of the country delegations um, were instructed to fill out a, a, a metadata template. Uh, this was uh, produced using an Excel-based uh, metadata template um, that included uh, over 200 different uh, metadata variables. Uh, the teams also had very clear instructions about uh, which uh, variables were um, essential or compulsory in a sense and which variables were optional if uh, the, the information was available. And the last uh, uh, stage uh, in which we're still immersed um, uh, was to establish uh, quality checks. And um, this has been uh, assured uh, primarily uh, uh, in the central team of uh, Sciences Po um, with the collaboration both of the resources provided by the Shock project as well as uh, human resources uh, provided by the uh, short-term scientific missions funded by the Cost Action Ethnic Survey um, data. And uh, for uh, 13 countries, we've now uh, finished uh, this process of uh, data uh, quality control and we've been um, able to upload the information of uh, those 13 surveys on the online tool. And this is um, what I will be uh, showing to you um, in a minute, which are the, the countries uh, that are included in this uh, better version. And uh, it's a better version at this stage because um, uh, both uh, the, the full list of countries that will be um, included have not yet been uh, included, but also um, because um, the, um, uh, there are a number of, um, uh, of tools and utilities that we will want uh, to be uh, including in the coming uh, months. So uh, at this stage, uh, the, the registry uh, captures more than 460 surveys that come 
from 13 different countries. And in this map and on this slide, you can see uh, both what countries uh, these are, but also uh, in parentheses, how many surveys were identified um, in each of the countries uh, that were conducted to ethnic and migrant minority populations since January um, uh, 2000. And you can already see that there is a huge uh, variation in terms of um, how uh, survey data reach each of those countries are um, uh, clearly with the United Kingdom, um, Germany, and to a certain extent as well, uh, Sweden uh, being very uh, survey data rich and other countries only um, uh, sort of um, identifying a, a handful or a few number of uh, surveys uh, um, that are particularly of, of interest to study the integration of ethnic and migrant uh, minority populations. Um, as you can see uh, from, from your screen, uh, right now we have a combination of both uh, Northern European countries and uh, Central European and, and Eastern European countries, as well as uh, um, Turkey. And as we move along uh, in finishing the quality control process, uh, we're hoping to have data for somewhere between 20 and 25 countries um, overall. Now, um, uh, in terms of who actually has uh, so far shown uh, uh, interest in the survey registry, this uh, slide um, uh, allows you to have a clear idea of how um, uh, naturally our main um, audience uh, targeted um, is uh, based in Europe, uh, primarily because uh, clearly uh, Europeans will be more interested in, in data about the ethnic and migrant minorities that we cite um, in Europe. But, but there's a kind of non-negligible uh, portion of uh, users that come from other um, areas of the world. And very importantly, uh, we are um, wanting to make this resource uh, known uh, to audiences that are not just academic. Um, uh, so we're particularly interested in making the registry uh, well known and hopefully uh, well used by a range of uh, policymakers at local, regional, national, uh, European and international level, but also very importantly, uh, people who work uh, for think tanks or who work for civil society organizations um, that might be um, interested in learning more about aspects of um, uh, integration, exclusion, exclusion, and, and discrimination. Um, in a minute, I will be uh, showing you live how the uh, tool um, uh, works. But before we do so, just in case uh, for some of you, the, the streaming of the online demonstration uh, gets stuck, I, I wanted to show you this one slide uh, where you can see the overall structure of uh, what we call the, the front end and the key functionalities of uh, the registry. Um, uh, basically, basically, what we have is a, a series of uh, tools that allow you to search in various ways uh, for the service that might be of greater um, interest to you. Uh, so we have um, an area where you can actually uh, search freely uh, with free types of uh, text uh, for either countries or keywords or institutions or kind of the scope of the of um, uh, uh, the survey. And then we also have uh, an area uh, with simple uh, filtering uh, tools, uh, as well as an area for um, advanced uh, filtering tools. Um, what I'll do now is I will be um, uh, sharing my screen and um, uh, showing you uh, live um, how we uh, can actually use um, the tool uh, directly. The um, link uh, to access um, uh, the tool is uh, ethnicsurveydatahub.eu uh, slash EMM uh, registry slash. And that first page um, where you land um, allows you uh, to have all of the detailed information of how uh, we've produced uh, the survey registry. So you can read at your own time uh, the whole methodology. Uh, that we've used. You can check out um, the guidelines uh, that the country delegations had to use, as well as check out the, the metadata compilation uh, template document and the training videos that we uh, recorded so that all the national teams could follow the same uh, procedures, as well as the guidelines for quality control um, that we'd use. In addition to that, in this area, 
you can actually see highlighted in blue um, the countries um, that have already been uh, uploaded into uh, the registry. And if you click on any of those countries that are already available, what you get is a description of, uh, first of all, who helped, who contributed uh, to compiling the metadata, when was the last time that the metadata record uh, was updated, and specific pieces of information of what sort of technical thresholds in terms of sample sizes were established for that particular country for inclusion of um, the surveys. Now, um, you have uh, also information about uh, how you can cite and how you can use we use the, the, the metadata from the registry, as well as information as on how you can contribute and support uh, to the sustainability of the registry. Once you've read through all of that information, you can access the, the, the registry through this button here, uh, but I've already opened uh, that uh, to speed up the process a bit, and you will land um, into the survey registry um, uh, directly. I'm going to make the font a little bit larger so you can see better on your screens. Um, once there is no, so once you land uh, on the registry, the first thing that you see is that you get the full uh, list of the 466 uh, surveys that are currently uh, uploaded into the tool. So um, you could certainly scroll down and, and check one by one, but we assume that this will not be the preferred mode of uh, looking at uh, the registry. You can see by clicking on the simple filtering uh, um, uh, menu that you have on your left-hand side, all of the countries that are currently um, included there. So you can uh, use simple filters uh, for those. Uh, perhaps you're interested only in uh, survey data uh, from Croatia, and then you get a restricted uh, uh, search result of the 38 um, uh, surveys that were um, uh, identified uh, for Croatia. But you can further filter by, for example, deciding that you're interested only perhaps in surveys that were done at the subnational level, so either at the local or the regional uh, level, and that perhaps you're going to be only looking at surveys that are repeated cross-sectional uh, surveys, so where you have multiple waves uh, with different samples, uh, but very similar or the same uh, questionnaire. So in this way, through the simple filtering, you can uh, narrow down your um, search results uh, further. You can also clear all selections and uh, start again. If you're interested in more surveys, uh, sorry, in more uh, variables than the ones that are available here in the simple um, filter area, you can actually um, uh, use the advanced filtering option, which allows you to select a larger number of variables uh, from which uh, to filter. Very importantly, it is in the advanced filtering where we have um, included the main topics in the survey, which is uh, what we would presume um, a, a primary focus of interest for uh, uh, people wanting to use or learn about those surveys. Perhaps your interest is only in a specific uh, topic. Um, so um, in addition uh, uh, to that, you can do uh, free text searches here. So if you're interested only in the Roma uh, population, you can narrow down the result uh, to the surveys covering only the Roma population. And uh, once you've narrowed down your, your search, uh, you can then click on any of the surveys and find all of the detailed information about um, each of the individual uh, surveys with the description of um, what uh, uh, the survey uh, included in terms of topics, in terms of its connection to larger studies, and um, in terms of what are the uh, migrant populations that were specifically um, uh, targeted. The last point I will uh, mention is that we have this XML link here that will allow you uh, to download, if you're interested, uh, all of the metadata per uh, survey in DDI um, format. Uh, and I'll stop there uh, and I'll uh, uh, relay uh, the presentation uh, so that Ami can um, continue uh, to present the back end now. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. So let me just catch up and get to the 
slide about the back end. So as Laura mentioned, the back end is the space that's behind the front end, and it's really where we're able to not only manage the metadata that users are able to interact with on the front end, but also the metadata schema itself. And as a reminder, that is the set of variables that we have identified as a data community um, that we want to have information captured for each survey that's subsequently added to the EMM survey registry. And then also the backend is a space that allows us to manage how exactly the user is able to interact with the front end. Um, and it's really these kind of management oriented or focused functionalities of the backend that ensure that the EMM survey registry is set up so it can be sustained and updated in the short and long term. So you can almost think about the sustainability of the EMM survey registry resting on these three pillars based on how um, we're able to manage the metadata, the schema, and the uh, view or presentation of the front end. Um, so to illustrate each kind of functionality, so I'm going to start with the metadata schema and how we're able to manage that. Um, by that, we really mean how easily we can adapt and adjust the schema so that it can be reactive and responsive to new and involving research and policy demands. Um, and it's something this the way in which we modify the metadata schema is something that is done by the administrators of the EMM survey registry, so someone like myself. Um, and to give you an example um, of how this type of adjustment to the schema might take place, uh, so right now we are aware that there are a number of COVID-related surveys that are being done across the world, um, and they include, in many cases, a substantive number of EMM respondents. So perhaps there is a need to actually include as part of our metadata a variable that denotes yes or no whether or not a survey has been done within the context of COVID. And we can easily do that with the way the backend is set up. We go into the backend space that is set up for the metadata schema. We insert a variable that um, is, is a yes or no question. Was the survey conducted uh, with the COVID topic? Um, and then once we add it in, it automatically is included in the metadata schema so that all future records about surveys uh, now require a response to that variable. And then for all existing records that we have on the registry, that variable is also inserted and then it appears with a default kind of dash line uh, to indicate that no response has been provided yet, but we can go back and then adjust the responses so we clearly document when surveys have been conducted within the context of COVID and when they have not. Um, so the next kind of functionality is the way in which the front end has been set up for the user. And again, we mean here how exactly we're able to easily implement these updates. So um, it, similarly to how we manage the metadata schema, this management uh, functionality is also reserved for the administrators. And building on the same example of this COVID-related uh, variable, we can take things a step further further by actually making this variable uh, something that uh, individuals can filter uh, using the simple and advanced filter option on the front end. And we go about it in the same way where we access the back end. We then um, indicate on the back end space dedicated to the metadata schema, this variable we actually want to now include as a filtering option. And then once we implement that change, it's automatically presented on the front end so that now anyone who comes to the registry and wants to find COVID related surveys can use that variable. And then they can find immediately because a list of all the uh, surveys for which there was a yes response are displayed automatically. Now the last uh, kind of management related functionality is related to how we add and edit the metadata for the EMM survey registry. And this specific functionality is not necessarily restricted to the administrators. As Laura alluded in her presentation, um, this is something that we have envisioned so that external users, so all of you participating in this webinar are able to contribute and participate in as well. So instead of kind of talking through an example, I wanted to use actually the live demonstration of the backend to illustrate when and how you might want to add an edit metadata to the EMM survey registry. So let me now go ahead and share my screen. All right. So hopefully you see um, this website called with uh, Laravel Nova as the header. 
Um, and this is the specific URL to access the backend. Um, this backend space is currently hidden from external users. Um, and it's because we're still in the process of finalizing how we actually want external users to be able to request and subsequently obtain their personal account. Um, but once we finalize that process, we'll make sure that it's explicitly stated on the EMM survey registry welcome page that Lauda had presented. And we'll also work to disseminate this information so that we can start bringing in these external users to start contributing to the registry. Now, for anyone who is offered or issued an account, um, you'll get a unique account that is linked to a specific email address and um, requires uh, a unique password. So for the purposes of this presentation, we have a dummy account set up with a, a project kind of web uh, or email address. I'm going to go ahead and log in. And the account for this dummy account is set up exactly how an external user would be able to view and engage with the backend. So once you log in, you're immediately presented with this dashboard and it provides very high level info about what's going on with the registry. So what kind of surveys are already there? What kind of users um, have engaged with the registry? For adding and editing metadata, the section that's most relevant is under resources and then this uh, sub kind of category surveys. Once you click on it, you're presented or directed to a new page where all of the information about the surveys is captured. Again, you see the dashboard kind of details about the surveys presented here. But now if you scroll down, you see this full list of surveys that exist on the back end. And I will note here that the back end um, does include a bit extra records, mainly because we have some that are in draft and ready published. And those are just um, survey records that have not yet been validated by us, the central team kind of doing the quality checks. But once they are, they'll be switched to publish, and then it would be viewable and accessible on the front end. In terms of kind of when you might uh, add in a survey record of your own. So imagine I am a researcher in France and I've just done a, I guess we're continuing on with this COVID theme, a COVID uh, survey to understand the experience for the Roma population in Paris. I would then go to create survey here and it will prompt me to a form and it's completely blank. But the form is set up in line with the metadata schema we have, and it's the same structure as the way in which the information on the front end is displayed, but in a form format. And you have specific variables and instructions on how you fill out each one. Um, and essentially, the logic is that you would go through one by one, filling in the information that you have. Um, and I will mention here that we do have this small red asterisk next to variables for which we think is really critical to have information about. Um, and we want people to try their very best to, to provide the information for. So just to illustrate kind of how it works. So since I said my example was a survey in France, I would select France as a country. I could put the survey name here, COVID in France, maybe Roma. Um, and then it would go like this where I would just go through each and every one um, and and fill in the information. Now, as you can see, we have a lot of variables. We have over 200 that are part of the schema, so it can take some time to fill out the information. So we do suggest that every so often, so perhaps every section or every 10, 15 variables, you come down to this button here, create survey, um, to save your work. Um, because unfortunately, right now, the current state of the backend uh, form is such that if you accidentally hit your mouse and you move away from the page, it doesn't save any of the work. There's no auto saving. So unfortunately you lose out any information you've inputted. So saving is a critical part of filling out this form. Um, whenever you do at least fill in some information and you click create a survey, it will automatically create a record. It will leave it in draft status. And it also shows you uh, as a reminder what you filled out information for. And then if you go back to the main surveys page, it'll automatically show up here as a survey and draft status. And there's an additional kind of feature that's added in. Because you were the individual who created this record, you have now been granted what we call editing rights. So now you can go back in and modify the information or enhance the metadata that you have. Um, it, I will, I guess, also mention right now that if, um, if you weren't the original producer for a record, but perhaps you were the one who created this survey here, Muslim Life in Germany, and you let us know that actually it's your survey and you want to have editing rights, we can manually um, assign the editing rights to you. So it has this kind of ability to adapt and respond to kind of what is going on uh, with the users. Um, so 
in the case of the example that I was giving, um, maybe it's I'm done with the field work for the survey, I have all the technical documentation produced, and I'm ready to kind of enrich the metadata that I've already documented. If I click on that pencil and paper icon, it brings me back to this form exactly with the same set of information that I inputted previously. And now I can just go in and maybe denote the variables that I want to now fill out. And the same thing happens um, if you go on create survey at the bottom and saves the work. Now, in terms of actually submitting your record for review, right now the process is the following. Um, once you're done, we ask that an email is sent to shock.project at sciencepo.fr. Um, you indicate that you know you have produced this record, and you can include the survey name, what you put into variable 1.3, or ideally, um, it would be nice to use the unique ID that's automatically issued by the backend, and that will um, make things easier for us to find the record. Um, and then once we, the, the central team, have a chance to review the, the record, we'll get, give feedback, and it'll go through an iterative process, but then once it's validated, we'll put the record in ready status. That way, you as the user have one final chance to look through the record. And then once we both agree that the record is ready, it will be the status will shift to published. And then the record will now be displayed on the front end and visible to all. Now, one other thing I wanted to illustrate is, um, I guess, other ways in which you can add metadata. And so this example, I'm going to use um, the UK Understanding Society uh, survey um, because they, I know, are working on a COVID-related uh, wave right now. So what I know already, because the UK has already contributed metadata to our uh, registry, is that we have captured quite a number of ways for understanding society. And what that means is we have full records about these surveys already inputted. And in, so instead of filling out a completely empty form and filling out 200 plus variables one by one, we can actually populate the form with information that we have for the Understanding Society waves. So how this is done is you could, for example, filter by the survey name or the country, but actually I think the easiest will be to use this search field. And if you go here, you'll see if I just put an understanding, it pulls up the nine waves of the Understanding Society wave that we have. And what I can do is now, if I want to pre-populate a form with that information, I go to clone survey, run action. And now it presents this form, but with the information from the past waves already inputted. And now I can go in and just change in the information. So for example, maybe this, the acronym is UK HLS uh, COVID as the acronym, and maybe it's wave 10 um, COVID and uh, etc. So it makes it a little bit easier if you need to um, create a record and we already have the record already of a, a previous way to input it um, and you're able to go about it that way. And the way in which you would submit a record that's produced this way, it's the same process. Once you're done, you would just drop an email to the shock.project at sciencepo.fr email address. All right, so I think that was all that I wanted to share for the back end. So I'll go ahead and stop the screen share. And if I could go back to the slides, perfect. Um, so the last thing I wanted to just touch on is what the next steps are given the current state of our EMM survey registry, which you saw is fully functional and already displays metadata for 460 plus surveys. We want to make sure now that the back end of the EMM survey registry, the part that I showed you, is accessible to external users so we can continue to build up the metadata that we have. We also want to continue to add metadata that has already been compiled by the Ethnic and Migration Studies data community, which uh, Laura talked a little bit more about, because we have a remaining 20 plus countries for which um, we are currently kind of checking the metadata for and that need to be added to the registry. And then finally, um, we want to identify specific updates or enhancements that can be made to the registry, whether it's the front or back end, that will really enhance the user experience. So for example, it could be making sure that it's easier to find this, the save button on the back end form so you don't have to scroll through a list of 200 uh, variables, for example. Um, so 
thank you all for your attention. And we uh, look forward to hearing any questions and suggestions you may have. Um, and finally, I'll just point out at the bottom here, we do have some links for some resources that we have available, the website for our data community, the specific link to the registry, and then our Zenodo page where we try to publish anything that we have related to the work that we are doing. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, now, this uh, is the end of our webinar for today, but we have plenty of time for questions and comments from the attendees. So anyone in the audience, if you have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat, and I will read it out to the speakers. Uh, Blanca has a question. A general question. Um, she's asking, how can we help or participate? I'm guessing researchers, people who yes. have their own surveys. Yep. Um, so, so people who actually have uh, produced uh, their own survey data uh, can help uh, um, uh, moving forward by uh, contributing to uh, the registry. Uh, we are in the process of setting up uh, the forms that will allow people to create an account uh, for themselves and um, have access to this backend that Ami just presented. Um, and very importantly, once um, a country, uh, the metadata for a, a given country is uploaded into the tool, then people from, from that country who have actually produced survey data from that country are more than more than welcome to check um, whether the surveys that they are aware of and that they uh, know well actually uh, have been included in the registry or whether there's uh, any survey that has been inadvertently um, omitted um, and that we've not included uh, by either a mistake or, or accident. So these are two ways in which people can help and can contribute either contributing new surveys that are, for example, um, in the field uh, as we speak or that will be in the field uh, um, in, in the coming months um, and um, uh, complementing information uh, that it's missing for past surveys, um, at least going back to January 2000. Okay, very well. Amit, do you have anything to add or does this uh, no, answer. I think um, she covered uh, the main point, so we can move on okay. to another question. Um, we have another question from Julie. Um, she is asking why you decided to build an interface from scratch rather than using already existing data or met metadata sharing solutions like NADA or Dataverse, etc. So I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer that. Um, actually, the, 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 the reason is a, a very practical one. Um, at the point when we started all of this work, um, uh, the projects that are now um, available on the possibility of adapting uh, Dataverse uh, were not uh, there yet. Uh, so if we were doing this work now, we would not probably do it in the same way that we've uh, uh, done it um, uh, so far. Uh, so we didn't have uh, the, the technical support that would allow us to adapt uh, something as uh, complex as Dataverse uh, for a relatively uh, small and not so very well resourced um, data community. So at that point, it was a, a matter of uh, technical uh, possibilities and, and competences, but also how adapted um, uh, the structure of Dataverse seemed to be a priori with the kind of details that we wanted to include in terms of the metadata uh, variables. Uh, we've actually then changed um, our approach for the second component. Um, so our second component of uh, uh, having a collection of uh, questionnaires uh, will not be done from scratch. Uh, it will be done as part of uh, the operations of uh, the SESTA-led uh, European Question Bank. So um, I think it's primarily a, a matter of, of timing and pragmatic considerations at the point when we started working on this, which is now nearly four years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Amy, would you like to add anything? Okay, uh, Jonathan is commenting that um, 
there's an understanding society COVID-19 study. So um, he has decided to contribute that to the database. So this was yeah. a very valuable event that we put together today. Yeah. At least you're getting new, <laughs> new data. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so I just wanted to mention, Jonathan is actually one of our uh, members of Ethnic Survey Data. So um, particularly for those who are part of the Ethnic Survey Data membership and you've helped to compile the metadata, very soon um, we will be opening up first to you uh, access to the backend so that you can uh, get a feel for what that looks like and also edit the metadata that you've already compiled, but also contribute any new surveys that you've come across, like the new Understanding Society COVID uh, wave, which I also coincidentally happened to use as an example for my uh, presentation. Yes, and if I can add uh, to that, uh, once we have set up all of the processes uh, for people to be able to sign up through a form to create an account, we will be also uh, doing a, a, a campaign uh, announcing uh, the fact that uh, people can actually now contribute with new uh, survey uh, metadata. And in particular, we will be targeting, because we do know that there is a, a wide number of uh, uh, surveys around COVID-19 and how they are affecting, in particular, the ethnic and migrant minority communities. So we will be sending emails um, uh, to the European Survey Research Association, to Wayport, to Shock, and to other email lists, as well as on Twitter and Facebook, uh, to make people aware of the fact that they can now contribute at least the survey metadata and uh, um, information about any reports and uh, where the data might become available in the future, so that then people can uh, use that, that sort of mini collection around COVID-19 also to identify the surveys that they could use potentially for comparative analysis, um, um, even if the surveys have not been done necessarily as cross-national surveys from, from scratch. Brilliant. I don't see any new questions from the audience, so uh, maybe I can ask one final question before we wrap up for the day. Um, do you already have any reports uh, of any research that has been made possible with your, uh, with your work through your um, collection of all the metadata and the surveys? Yes. Um, so what we have, and you can if you can actually check on our Senado uh, community, which is on on the last slide that uh, Ami has left on the on the screen. We did uh, publish a first uh, version of our report analyzing the survey metadata for the the first subset of countries um, that were already um, available uh, this spring while we were, were all uh, in confinement. We're planning to uh, uh, publish um, in that same as another community, uh, but it's also available in our um, uh, ethnic survey data uh, website as well. Um, uh, updated reports um, uh, focusing on the uh, knowledge strengths and the knowledge uh, gaps that uh, we can already identify uh, with the survey metadata. And very importantly, that report uh, highlights not just what these surveys cover and uh, what they don't, uh, but very importantly, they also offer us a very uh, clear picture of all the work that we still need to do to make sure that the data are reusable. Um, uh, so we have a section uh, specifically discussing data availability and uh, to, to which extent the surveys have been deposited or not in data archives and how this varies across countries and, and, and what is the situation. And uh, we also have a number of recommendations that we make at the end of the report on, on, on how both uh, um, the knowledge pool can be improved uh, with uh, in the future by conducting surveys that are more targeted at specific topics that are less well covered, but also how we can, um, in terms of the open science and the open data agenda, uh, try to uh, target uh, uh, these specific uh, data uh, production communities to uh, nudge them perhaps to um, deposit data that we can perhaps consider is historical now if they're from the, the early 2000s so that they can be reused and that can become available for uh, uh, researchers interested in, in, in reanalyzing them. 
This is brilliant. I think what you're doing is amazing. It will contribute not only uh, avoiding duplicate work uh, work uh, in the field and uh, so that people can get to know each other's work better, but I think it will also lead to impro improved service overall. So I would like to thank you for all what you're doing and especially for delivering the webinar today. And I would like to say goodbye to everyone and have a nice rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. And keep in touch. Yeah. Bye.